Pinter, Beckett, and Proust. And that's how I got away with writing about Pinter without having Martin be my uh, advisor. But uh, I will say when I, when I um, looked through this book again and looked at, uh, at Esselin's essay in this book, I was um, pretty uh, happy and surprised to learn how much I agreed with what he was saying, which is basically, you know, the dramaturg, as we know, is a German construct. And in the German theater, uh, he says it is a, it's a very top level position. Someone who's supposed to know every level, like who goes to the other theaters and scouts actors and is reading the plays and is, uh, and he said that in the university system, no one even does plays. If you're training to be a dramaturg, you're like studying the form. And, and he said, you know, in America, the dramaturg has another even more important function probably, which is to uplift the form in a way in a culture that does not embrace it. Uh, he said in Germany, you know, there's a joke that if you get, if you're a bureaucrat and you get demoted, they say oh, he was demoted to a town that doesn't even have a theater. Um, in the same way we would say demoted to a town that doesn't even have a baseball team. Um, Anyway, I, I, I really agree with that. I feel that um, that is something I always believed in as in my job that, you know, there's, there, we are split in two as a field, aren't we? We are uh, aiming for the loftiest ideas and we are part of the nitty gritty. And we, and we also uh, often go into our little rooms and shut the door and, and our, you know, our bemused uh, fellow staff members say, oh yes, Tim's in there reading a play. Uh, and there's something ivory tower about it. But really, uh, it falls on us to make the case for what we do and why it's vital and important. Oh, I was going to press this stopwatch and know how long I was talking. It's probably four minutes already. Oh, well, well, well. Um, anyway, I, um, I'm going to look at my page. Um, the last time I was in this room, which is a very difficult room for a speech, uh, was the Pulitzer luncheon for Annie Baker. And I say that not to like wave my flag, although it is running and you should see it because it's a great production. Although I haven't seen the, at least the, this version yet, I haven't had time. But you know, Annie was doing a talk back with me and she's uh, after the flick and she said, you know, the theater, I love the theater because it's the art form that is best for dealing with ambivalence and ambiguity. And, uh, and I agree completely with that. And I, f I just referred to the kind of split focus of dramaturgs. And I think, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, that, that uh, dichotomous dynamism is part of every production, really. Um, uh, when I was training, um, <laughs> I took a little break from, from academia, like one year off, like to try to figure out how to write this heady dissertation I was going to do. And I took uh, acting classes with Michael Shirtliff, who uh, was a casting director and uh, a great teacher, really. And he wrote a book that if you have friends who are actors, they should read it. Uh, it's called How to Audition. Uh, and I really liked the way he framed this, I, what I was just referring to, uh, the split focus, because he said every, you know, the, the, the idea of the actor's objective, he boiled down to what do I want if you're an actor? And then he said, okay, when you figure that out, now figure out what's the opposite. What's the opposite of what I want, because you want that too. And uh, then that person is dealing with another person. Uh, and that same kind of uh, dynamism, that sort of Hegelian um, dynamic of thesis, antithesis, synthesis happens on our stages. The other thing I think is unique about, because it's the only art form that really uh, uses as its instrument and palette the human being, uh, the other truth about that when I studied uh, Proust and uh, Pinter, Beckett, uh, what goes along with that is studying Bergson. And Bergson's not really um, that fashionable, 
but his view of time is that uh, is very valuable for we in the theater because his view of time is uh, not that time is linear. We're all against linearity in the theater, aren't we? Or in our art. Uh, he said um, time is volumetric. It's durational. That uh, time doesn't, you know, end and go away. It fills us up. And I think uh, we know that about time, and we know that's how we uh, discover the truth of what we're looking for, what it's our obligation to uncover. Um, and, um, and we see actors who all of them are playing characters, and they have, um, they have that sense of duration. You know they have a history. The other one of the other um, guide posts that Shirtliff said was, "What's your what is your history? What's your past history?" And that's you know our best actors are so adept at doing exhaustive research and then making it organic and not making it um, um, sort of a heady choice. Um, wow, you know when I when I was doing this uh, prep for this, I I quote I wrote I brought look at this. All these things I wanted to read, they're like things that really inspire me. Um, and I might just feel like I can't, you know, this, this here's D Bergson's uh, definition of duration. The piling up of the past upon the past goes on without relaxation. In reality, the past is preserved by itself automatically. In its entirety, probably, it follows us at every instant. All that we have felt, thought, and willed from our earliest infancy is there leaning over the present which is about to join it, pressing against the portals of consciousness that would fain leave it outside. I, I love that quote. Um, because w really theater, all art is, it's, it's urging us to open our eyes and to discover something. Uh, at the TCG conference that was just a week ago, uh, Lisa Cron was a keynote speaker, and she ga she she gave an extemporaneous sort of um, both uh, description of her journey, but also what she discovered about the truth of theater from her point of view in storytelling. And she made the point, which I'm going to repeat here, that um, theater is about not a truth that is a priori given that we um, uh, are are trying to show. It's a, it's a truth that the characters discover, and that uh, that recognition, that, that result of choices, is also unique to the theater. And um, uh, it's something that inspires me. You know, it's, it's, it's the, the danger in the arts is to fetishize what you're doing, to, um, to see it as important in and of itself. Uh, and that's why, you know, I look to you to be spokesmen, spokespeople, spokeswomen for our field because um, it's a very crowded, there are a lot of worthy causes. It's a very crowded um, uh, market square. And we, we need to voice our, our, our passionate belief in the indispensability of what we do and that, uh, our, our playwrights are, by the way, I love the t-shirt. And at first I thought, well, that's kind of a Ptolemaic view of the universe, isn't it? To put the, the dramaturg at the center. Isn't the playwright at the center b working in a writer's theater? Of course I feel that. But then I decided maybe it's, it's Einsteinian, maybe it's relativistic, and that <laughs> it's about the sort of cross intersectionality of, of all these fields. So I, I forgive you our t-shirt, and maybe I'll try to get one. Um, what else did I write down here? Uh, the other thing, um, the other thing Shirtliff would say is that every scene is a love scene. Every scene is a love scene. <laughs> uh, and that seems like, what? If love is, you know, lo he said make life or death choices. And, and l having, needing love and especially if you're not getting it, uh, leads to a lot of violence. So even in a violent scene, <laughs> there's probably love in there somewhere to understand it. And um, one of the, 
This is uh, Emmanuel Levinas, who's a philosopher I liked a lot. The first content of expression is the expression itself. To approach the other in conversation is to welcome his expression, in which at each instant he overflows the idea a thought would carry away from it. It is therefore to receive from the other beyond the capacity of the I, which means exactly to have the idea of infinity. But this also means to be taught. The relation with the other or conversation is a non-allergic relation, an ethical relation. Um, he's getting at why in philosophical terms uh, insularity is, is um, the enemy. In some ways, you know, Levinas was in conversation with Heidegger, um, but I will, my next thought is related to that, which v is with the artist. And so how did I become literary manager of the theater that specializes in new American plays when my, my field of expertise was Proust, <laughs> Pinter, Beckett, Genet, Strindberg. Uh, it's because, here's a quote from Proust, and it aligns perfectly with the mission statement of Playwrights Horizons. Style for the writer, no less than color for the painter, is a question not of technique, but of vision. It is the revelation of the qualitative difference, the uniqueness of the fashion in which the world appears to each one of us. Thanks to art, instead of seeing one world only, our own, we see that world multiply itself and we have at our disposal as many worlds as there are original artists. Uh, that be, that's like kept me young, that, that, that philosophy. So every play I enter, there's no program, there's no cookie cutter, there's no way to do it. The way to do it is imminent within that writer and it is our responsibility to um, uh, find that conversation. You know, it used to be, I hope it's different, you know, w many of the quotes in, in, the, in the dramaturgy book, like there was a, a round table with with Eric Overmeyer and Connie Congdon, and there was a lot of dramaturg bashing in that, like, don't talk to the play. <laughs> My advice, how to talk to a playwright, don't. Talk to the director. That's Eric Overmeyer's uh, perspective. And, you know, and I think more and more, I, f I, f I am so inspired by the staff who does the literary work, which I just keep growing because I feel that just like the truth of playwriting, that we are in a golden age, that there are so many incredible writers writing that it's really hard to choose. Uh, I also find that starting from the beginning, we have a wonderful resident fellowship program. That's how I got started at Playwrights Horizons. I was a intern then. Uh, I just feel I was lost compared to these incredibly intelligent, sophisticated, uh, um, well-trained, knowledgeable uh, devotees of the theater who come in and fill the staff and then get jobs. And, uh, but you know, it's also, um, I would also say it's reciprocal relationship and uh, make sure you, make sure you respect your elders. Uh, that's a good uh, trans-global uh, um, ethical stance, I think. Um, and I think that would also, I'm going to get like, there's parts of this that are advice uh, to you in the field. I, I, I would say, you know, the part, we're, we're trying to be ambitious and humble, right? That's what that's what it's our calling is, and 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 the, the ambition is to love how high that playwright is reaching, and to uh, and to communicate as you woo that playwright, as you would pitch your woo to the love of your life. The goal is to convince that writer that you love the play better than they themselves do, and that uh, and that you, but that at the same time you need some humility about the fact that you're not the playwright. Um, and that's important. I also believe in candor and that um, 
you know, I don't believe in giving notes. We, we receive a thousand plus plays and do six and maybe do 20 readings and develop things and maybe give six or seven commissions. Uh, so what is the trick of keeping love alive with the other 964 writers who are not? And I, I really don't feel blanket sort of form letters is the way to do it. I think y you've got to develop that knack for both praising and letting, letting down gently and, and making, it, making them understand it's a, uh, that you want to see their future work if you do. And uh, they are big boys and girls, our playwrights. They want to know something. Uh, not that it's the truth, but it's your truth. And um, I, I, I believe in that kind of candor. Um, what else do I have to say? Um, in the same way, like, you know, it's, it's, is that my timer? Is that like the orchestra playing? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah, I forgot to give the cell, you didn't give the cell note, cell phone speech, did you? Um, I, you know, the, there, there are things like, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I, I want you to understand the context of what I'm about to say because, you know, no one's had a better track record at, at gender equality and programming than Playwrights Horizons. Uh, but I'm going to say that was not, I don't want you to pause, but thank you. Um, I will say there's something, and this has to do with the seniority issue, I'm slightly irritated with the Kilroy's list. Even though I, I appreciate that there are the attempt to improve it and widen it, because it is looked to as a kind of, um, you know, the guide in a way. And, and I think that mid-career and older career writers are being ignored in that list. And they're like the writers that I've produced that I think are wonderful writers like Marlena Meyer, Kathleen Tolan, Kia Corthran, Wendy McLeod, I don't see them on that list, and I'm not sure why. I think Wendy McLeod, I think uh, Marlena Meyer is probably one of our five most unique, gifted, uh, incredible writers, and, and her generation, which includes who, like Lynn Jenkin and Mac Wellman, and I mean, you know, the men people haven't forgotten, but let's not forget Marlena Meyer. And, and there are men also and um, that I think are struggling to get paying attention to. Uh, Christian, Evan Smith, Quincy Long, Neil Bell. These are like wonderful writers who happen to be over the age of 50, most of them. You know, they're good too. Uh, the other thing I want to just t close with, although I'll probably have to read one more quote because I can't help myself. Uh, you know, when we, I, I want to talk about uh, diversity, engagement, uh, equality a little bit. I think it's, w we need to, uh, in the theater, we're trying to create a utopia, aren't we? Um, to have a model of how things should work. And we're also like trying to show it like it is, which ain't so great all the time. Um, I think it's really important, you know, the. Uh, the, the struggle to organically diversify the work and the productions and the staff, uh, it, it, uh, it's, uh, in my mind, it's important to have a total community that we all fit into. And that the, the danger is that there can be a balkanization of communities, what you see in the, in, you know, it's happening all over East Europe and, I think, you know, let's not grab our feet. And I, I say this as someone who I remember going to rock concerts like festivals and seeing like Pentangle, Canned Heat, and the Isley Brothers. You know, and that, and it was, a, and, uh, and I, I, I was thinking of singing a little bit of Everyday People from Sly and the Family Stone <laughs> for you. Because I think, you know, it, it was a given that the music world was all encompassing and that we were all there together and that we didn't have a black festival and a, and a white festival and a rock festival and a jazz festival. You look at the f Fillmore acts and it was 
completely eclectic. And um, I felt this very strongly when we did Booty Candy this year, that this is a play for all of us who just like badass theater, like hilarious, theatrical, smart, badass theater. And so I, um, I, I shout out that to you. Let's keep it real, let's keep it organic. And um, can I read one more thing? Because it's one of my favorite, I don't know what this is doing here. It's, it has to do with the reality of time and the reality of love in one of the most, you know, bleak plays ever written. Uh, you know, Waiting for Godot. Waiting for Godot is, a, but it's a lot, if you don't have the love story in Waiting for Godot, you, you ain't got nothing. So, uh, was I sleeping while the others suffered? Am I sleeping now? Tomorrow when I awake, or think I do, what shall I say of today? That with Estragon, my friend, at this place, until the fall of night, I waited for Godot? We have time to grow old. The air is full of our cries, but habit is a great deadener. At me too, someone is looking. Of me too, someone is saying, he is sleeping, he knows nothing. Let him sleep on. I can't go on. What have I said? Let's not sleep. Thank you. I'm a huge fan of Playwrights Horizons, and for many years it's been a real joy to walk a couple blocks down 42nd Street and get inspired um, by new plays uh, and, and uh, some new writers and some older writers. So thank you for that and for all the work. It's an honor to be on this panel with you and Richard and, and Michelle. And uh, so thanks, Beth, for asking me to speak. Um, I'm not as good at speaking extemporaneously, so I wrote everything down. Um, Bear with me. One of the things I cherish most about LMDA is this dynamic network of dramaturgs at all stages of career and life who generously mentor and inspire one another. Although I still very much feel like an ECD, I suppose I'm now approaching what some would call mid-career, that vast expanse of time where you're so immersed in doing the work that you don't realize how much time is passing. Now, taking a moment to look up and look back, I can trace every significant professional break I've had to members of this organization. While I was pursuing an MA at Catholic University in the 90s, Professor Mary Reesing invited Kathy Madison, then literary manager of Arena Stage, to her dramaturgy seminar. As Kathy spoke about her work in a literary office, I lit up and immediately applied for an internship at Arena the, for the following season. While there, I felt my spine straighten from student to emerging professional as production dramaturg on two made stage shows. I benefited from the incredible openness of directors Doug Wager and Michael Kahn to my tentative, then more confident contributions. I attended my first LMDA conference in 1999 at the University of Puget Sound, during which I stood in awe at the assembly of icons of our field, all so warm and accessible and lovely. I also remember an incredibly passionate debate about whether or not to form a union, which I observed with mouth agape, but that's a reminiscence for the conference bar. <laughs> After I finished a theater history degree at the University of Washington, Jeff Prohl and John Wilson, who are here at this conference, and whom I met at that conference, not only gave me my first teaching gigs, but also took me under their wings as master dramaturgs and educators. Their faith in me has been and continues to be a priceless gift. And at this conference in Chicago 12 years ago, the inimitable Greg Gunter tried to convince me to consider applying for a crazy job helping him develop musical theater for Disney on Broadway. I was like, What? But for reasons still somewhat of a mystery to me, I applied for the job, landed the job, found last minute replacements for my classes, and once again moved my ass across the country. What was supposed to be a short detour from my intended academic career 
turned out to connect to deeply held values, fulfilling lifelong dreams, and blossoming in ways I couldn't have imagined. I've been able to work on projects that have impacted millions of people. My colleagues and collaborators are incomparable artists, thinkers, producers, and friends. It's amazing what you can do when you are surrounded by good people with a desire to make great things. Among other gifts, this job has opened doors to guest seminars at colleges around the globe, freelance gigs at cool places like the Kennedy Center, Berkeley Playhouse, and New York Theater Workshop, and even opportunities to employ my fellow Turgs. Saying yes to a call from left field can be a powerful thing. Although I certainly worked my butt off, I feel tremendously lucky every single day. Speaking of left field, as president-elect of LMDA, <laughs> I'm excited by this chance to give back to the organization and its members who have meant so much to me. This does not mean I'm not sweating bullets. But I suppose in order to grow, you've got to move toward the thing that scares you, as we sometimes advise the writers with whom we work. Thank God, I've got a year to shadow the indomitable Beth Blickers, and I'll have Sage Council of Brian Court and the rest of the board to catch me when I inevitably stumble. Despite challenges of definition and employment, our field has come a long way in these past three decades. We're still here and growing, we believe in the work which we execute in innumerable ways. We are not afraid to morph and innovate, and we have each other's backs. It's a remarkable thing, this community, because there's no good reason to be a dramaturg. I mean, who in her right mind would put in this much work for other people's glory? <laughs> but I truly believe it's not a choice. We're born this way. <laughs> it's a calling, or rather a recognition, an ultimate acceptance of who we're meant to be, how we're meant to move through the world and make art. It's a love of craft and process and possibility that transcends any particular project, job, or career path. It's a way of connecting to people and ideas that crosses national, linguistic, and disciplinary borders. I'm profoundly grateful to be in your midst among my tribe once again today. I'm a naturally optimistic dude. Uh, I suspect that may be why a day job at Disney has suited me for over a decade. <laughs> I'm also pretty ambitious when it comes to possibility and people. I like having a big, crazy vision and finding smart allies crazy enough to tackle it with me in practical ways. I like to see us stand firmly on the legacy of these past 30 years and challenge ourselves to imagine something new. What if the value of a dramaturgy degree weren't tied to landing a scarce job in a theatrical literary office? What if we assertively recruited our counterparts in television, film, and other mediums of dramatic and creative development to join our fold? There are thousands of executives who work with dramatic writers and have no idea we exist, or that there are other, perhaps more productive ways of working and being. What if we became a home for like-minded individuals in other fields who have no trade organizations of their own? What if their training and experience in other disciplines helped us break new ground in the theater? What if we took the hemispheric impulse of our name change seriously and pursued active artistic, institutional, and organizational relationships with collaborators south of the Rio Grande? What if, what if we went global? What if we dared to unleash the power of our unique intergenerational nexus of institutional, academic, and freelance workers beyond that which feels comfortable, parochial, and safe? What if? I'm sure you have some answers, or at least more and better questions. 
During my president-elect year, I plan to do some serious and seriously fun R&D to become aware of some of what I don't know that I don't know. And I'll start by hosting a series of what if salons. If you're interested in walking toward the thing that scares you for the chance of discovering something remarkable, come find me. I look forward to great things in this gift of an opportunity to serve you. Thanks. Inspiring. Hmm. I think um, these, uh, this 12 minute and uh, 45 second talk, speech, letter, uh, might actually fit in fairly well with Tim's remarks on love and history. <clears throat> Dear Canada, I'm on the verge of walking away from our relationship, I confess. I confess that I was going to go until LMDA President Beth Blickers, ever the diplomat, told me she was concerned that perhaps I hadn't expressed my feelings properly, that I hadn't sorted out our story. She suggested that if I wrote my thoughts down in a loving letter to you and then read the letter out loud to my friends at LMDA, then maybe we could find a way to stay together. Sometimes I feel we'll never know each other because, quite frankly, you just don't know yourself. This has been bothering me for a while. I've suggested therapy, but you keep claiming you can work out these identity issues on your own. It hasn't happened yet, and I'm beginning to wonder if it ever will. Who are you, Canada? In a 1967 television interview, the Canadian visionary Marshall McLuhan said, you're the only country in the world that knows how to live without an identity. Echoing his sentiment somewhat, the poet Irving Layton said, a Canadian is someone who keeps asking the question, what is a Canadian? I think he was confusing Canadians with dramaturgs, but anyway, <laughs> you get the idea. For as long as I can remember, you've defined yourself in opposition by talking about what you aren't rather than what you are. And at the top of the list of the things you claim you're not is American. Maybe you knew yourself back in the beginning, back in the early 1600s when you were one of the four colonies of New France, and the terms Canada and New France were interchangeable. But after the French ceded you to Britain in 1763 at the end of the French and Indian Wars, when New France became a part of the British Empire, your, self of sen your sense of self began to slide. When the United States was successful in their revolutionary bid to eliminate British rule from the 13 colonies, the, form, the areas of the former New France that stayed a part of Great Britain were given the names of Upper and Lower Canada. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist, but that sounds like the beginnings of dissociative identity disorder to me. It might have seemed like it was all going to work out when the English passed the British North America Act in 1867. It was Canada's confederation. You were quite the talker then, convincing the home country to let you go without firing a shot. You seem to be reborn as an independent nation, although parts of the BNA Act allowed the Governor General, the Queen's representative in Canada, the power to strike down laws enacted by the Canadian Parliament within three years of their passing. American identity stories are so clean. Maybe that's why you're so eager to adopt them. Take the Puritans and the Mayflower, for example. That story was so well packaged that you've introduced Puritan symbols into your own Thanksgiving celebrations, even though the Puritans had nothing to do with Canada. While the Protestant Puritans were arriving on the shores of New England, you, dear Canada, were welcoming the Catholic Jesuits to New France. Truth be told, I've always preferred the French-Canadian voyageurs to those stuffy, tight-ass Puritans anyway. The voyagers sang, they partied, they dressed in flamboyant clothing. It's like comparing the people of the Upper East Side to the people of Williamsburg. I also love the fact that the fun-loving, fur-trading French-Canadian voyageurs didn't see themselves as kings of the wild frontier. Their worldview was more in line with the native peoples with whom they worked. They saw themselves as part of nature, not as the rulers of it. I think that's an important part of who you are, and maybe it's true. I mean, it certainly was for those guys who started Greenpeace in Vancouver back in 1971. 
I love your images of Jacques paddling down the St. Lawrence River, singing French songs, stopping just long enough to get married. I love that you called the offspring of these French and First Nations people the Métis. It's got a nice ring to it. Okay, so you may have identity issues and a little anxiety, but at least you're a good planner. You remember back in the 1870s when the U.S. was randomly blasting its way through the Wild West? Your biggest railway company was planning its own incursions by drawing towns on maps, spacing them seven miles apart along the railway line, and naming them in alphabetical order. Fenwood, Goodeve, Hubbard, Ituna, Keller, Lestock, Punishy, Raymore, Siemens, Tate, now that's dramaturgy. Back in those days, your law enforcement was well planned too. Even so, I can't help but envy those great chaotic stories from the American West, where men were hard and their whiskey was harder. Where federal marshals stood their ground in front of the setting sun to dollop out big helpings of frontier justice to those stupid enough to take a seat at the wrong side of the law. In contrast, you, dear Canada, created a police force, trained them in the East, and then sent them westward to control the American whiskey smugglers in the towns that were still waiting to be built. You remember when you thought you'd spook the Americans into thinking there was an arms buildup happening on the border if you called the force the Northwest Mounted Rifles like you planned? So you called them the Northwest Mounted Police. That was very polite of you. A hundred years later, in 1994, the Disney Corporation was given a five-year contract to handle the marketing and licensing of RCMP iconography. Control of the trademarks had been given over to Disney when the RCMP hired the company to promote their image and protect them from being abused in the commercial marketplace. Let me get this straight, Canada. Your federal police force went to Disney for protection. I just can't see J. Edgar Hoover in bed with Mickey Mouse. That said, I have trouble picturing J. Edgar Hoover in a dress. Anyway, the whole thing makes me nervous. Margaret Atwood once said that if the national mental illness of the United States is megalomania, that of Canada is paranoid schizophrenia. Most people in Canada probably think that if the United States has a mental illness, we should have one too. Luckily, it's possible to treat both paranoid schizophrenia and megalomania with drugs. By the way, Canada, did you know you're the second largest per capita consumer of pharmaceutical drugs in the world? But guess who's first? <laughs> Canada, you really have to try harder. Pierre Trudeau, one of your most flamboyant and storied prime ministers, a guy who sometimes channeled the voyageurs in his photo ops, and the man who repatriated our constitution in 1982, said, Americans should never underestimate the constant pressure uh, on Canada which the mere presence of the United States has produced. We're different people from you and we're different people because of you. Living next door to you is in some ways like sleeping with an elephant. No matter how friendly and even tempered the beast, one is affected by every twitch and grunt. He also famously said after he decriminalized homosexuality in 1969, there's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation. Still, if you're seeing elephants in your bed, dear Canada, I suggest you try Seroquel. John Ralston Saul, one of your brightest public intellectuals, claims our roots of accommodation came through close working contact with the Aboriginals and the development of Métis culture. He believes that the often ignored role of the natives as full partners in the military, civil, and commercial affairs of the Canadas for the first 250 years of their existence is a huge problem when it comes to trying to articulate a national identity. Saul's premise is that unlike the U.S., whose foundation of statehood came out of the European Enlightenment, Canada's foundational culture is more aboriginal, embracing values of negotiation, tolerance, inclusivity, and accommodation. What Saul sees as a Métis view of living could be perceived as socialist. I'll be reading this letter to my American friends, and I don't think I can use the word socialist in the United States. <laughs> well, maybe in New York City. <laughs> Saying the word socialist, over the phone at least, could put me on the Department of Homeland Security's watch list. Socialism is so depraved that the word, the very word, is almost unspeakable in the United States. Better to talk in terms of the 99%, or income equality, or the wealth gap. I grew up in the province that was the birthplace of social democracy in Canada, and I'm proud of it. I wonder if I'll be taking the bus back to Vancouver when my flying privileges are revoked. 
Tommy Douglas and the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, later named the New Democratic Party, was elected on June 15, 1944. They formed the first socialist government in North America. As a Baptist minister and the leader of the CCF in Saskatchewan, Tommy Douglas brought his province North America's first arts council, a regional library system, an increase in the minimum wage, a work week capped at 44 hours, I wonder what happened to that, a guarantee of two weeks paid vacation for all workers and an increased education budget. The list goes on, including free health care for pensioners, free psychiatric hospital treatment for the mentally ill, and a balanced budget in the first four years of his mandate. Eventually, his work resulted in a ca Canada-wide guarantee of universal Medicare. In Douglas' own words, I felt that no boy should have to depend either for his leg or for his life upon the ability of his parents to raise enough money to bring a first-class surgeon to his bedside, and the people should be able to get whatever health services they require, irrespective of their individual capacity to pay. He also said a nation's greatness lies not in the quantity of its goods, but in the quality of its life. If it's one thing that holds us together, Canada, it's the idea that the tax base works to support the health of everybody in your family. There's something fundamental in that proposition. Today, for the first time in history, the NDP is your official opposition party in the federal parliament, and the party that just won the recent provincial election in Alberta. Alberta, the province that sends the United States more oil than anywhere else in the world. Alberta is a jurisdiction that up until two months ago had the same conservative party in power longer than the former ruling party in Egypt, which held power there for 49 years until the Arab Spring brought it down. Voting NDP in Alberta is like voting for Ralph Nader in Texas. You really made me laugh with that one. So why should I love you? For your humor, your interminable, almost paranoid insecurity, your lack of an articulated identity, and your basic decency. And for the fact that I still believe you're trying hard to be a fair country. Or maybe it's because you are no one and you are everyone. The famous arch Canadian architect Arthur Erickson argues that Canada's lack of a national identity will prove to be the country's strength in the 21st century as the world moves towards what he calls a humanity-wide consciousness. He goes on to say that by having no history or of cultural or political hegemony, we are more open to, curious about, and perceptive of other cultures. It's this open curiosity and respect that will continue to make you, Canada, one of the great 21st century social experiments. Right now, your foreign-born population is 22% compared with 13% in the US. It's one of the highest in the world, and yet things are still running pretty well, all things considered. Your social dramaturgs are still on task. John Ralston Saul also said, Canada is either an idea or it does not exist. It is either an intellectual undertaking or it is little more than a resource-rich vacuum lying in the buffer zone just north of a great empire. So how will your story end? Will you be subsumed by the United States or will you shine on as a fully realized nation? I have no idea. But for the moment, I think you characterize the notion of how people on a very small and very crowded planet might be able to live together side by side, uncertain of what to call the association, but reasonably comfortable with it nonetheless. And for that, Canada, I love you. Thank you. He has a date with Lucinda Williams? Wow. I'm going to go see Lucinda Williams. Can you hear me? Yeah? Without? Okay. Good evening. Hi. When Blickers asked me to give one of these um, musings for this year's LMDA conference, she said two things. Be reckless and be brief. Uh, I hope I'm at least one of them. Uh, these are my musings. Uh-oh. OK. I have, and I suspect that we all have, been thinking a lot about community and what that means, really, deeply, and truly what it means to me. I teach at Washington College, 
a small residential liberal arts college, community is a word that we bandy around a great deal there. It became quite meaningful in moments and becomes quite meaningful in moments that I'll talk about in a minute. I also live in Philadelphia, a city whose very name, city of brotherly love, implies the relationship of one to the other. As part of my city, there is also a theater community. Like many other theater communities, this one is strong and nurturing and rigorous, and on a more personal note, one that saved my life this year. And if I'm honest with myself, pay attention to that word honest, that salvation didn't have anything to do with a play. If my high school Latin is correct, the word community itself is comprised of three elements. Com, a Latin prefix meaning with or together. Munis, the changes or exchanges that link. And tatus, a Latin suffix suggesting diminutive, small, intimate, or local. So, a small, strong link. I like that. But where do we see that? What are the examples that resonate in our own lives? As I said, Washington College uses the word a lot. However, I don't think that my students really got what that meant until last spring when one of their own took his life in his dorm room. Our community was rattled and rocked. We adopted the hashtag Shorman Strong to help express our need for one another. In my department, one that was impacted pretty deeply by this death, our own adage, hashtag we are family, became our calling card, one for each other. Why am I hugging you right now? We are family. I watched the Kilroy's announcement last week and was delighted to see so many of my friends and colleagues cheering and celebrating one another and the work itself watching Gubbins, I hope she's out there somewhere, uh, work her magic make me appreciate my own community of Chicago theater, which also has had its own share of grief and pain in the past year. There's also the amazing effort of the hardest working man in show business, sound designer Lindsay Jones, who found a stellar way of celebrating the design and by extension the writing and directing communities through what he called the collaborator party an event that coincided with the Tony Awards. Should I talk about the Tony Awards? Probably not. I mean, I'm very happy that the people who won, won. I'm seeing Fun Home tomorrow night, and gosh, I love Janine Tesori, and I love Lisa Crone. Some of my best friends have won Tony Awards. But it did get me thinking. And here's the question that I will pose to you. Are we talking to ourselves? both about the work and then the work, the play itself? Are our celebrations of our work, which don't get me wrong, I don't think that's the issue, actually serving a community besides ourselves? And if so, do we have a responsibility to say so? Who is listening? Who is watching? Who is responding? Or are we chasing our own tails? Are we really and truly experiencing all facets of the communities in which we live? We spend a lot of time talking about how we are serving our community. Foundations, donors, and other gatekeepers give a lot of money to hear us talk about how we are exploring our communities where we live. But let's be honest, are we really? Is the work that we are making really impacting the greater world outside the walls, real or imagined walls, of our theaters? Is the answer to bring theater to the community, or is it to the bring the community to the theater, or is there something completely dif different? And if so, who's doing it? Why aren't we? There's also something else. What is the role of art in a community whose primary function isn't art, but is simply survival? or a roof over your head, or a meal, or health care. Who cares about the work that we do other than us? And if we're doing it for ourselves, whoever we are, let's be honest about it. 
My partner in playpen, the very grumpy Paul Mashegian, <laughs> sorry Paul, um, noted, visual artists are unabashed narcissists about their work. They make it for themselves. They don't care what you think. Huh, is this us? Do we care? Do we actually care, not just about our audiences, who are, let's be honest, a very rarefied community, and our articulated, mission-based communities? But what about the people with whom we share air on a daily basis, who have no idea what a play is, or a dramaturg, and don't really care? My students told me something very compelling this summer, this semester. They told me that the only time that they actually turn off their phones is when they come into the theater. I'm kind of certain that it's because that they're afraid of me and how batshit crazy I might go if I find it on. But I think that there's something else, something related to community, something much more basic. There is a deep need in us as humans to connect with each other, to sit in stillness, and listen to each other breathe. How often do we do this? Think about it. Do you make eye contact with people you don't know? Do you smile at the person that gets online behind you? Do you listen, really listen, when someone tells you their pain? If I acknowledge someone, even through eye contact, is that an invitation to engage? Or is it just an acknowledgement of humanity? And isn't that really the first step towards feeling a sense of community? Be honest. I think that diversity and gender parity and all our panel discussions about them are good and important and necessary. But what happens beyond that? How many different ways can we say it to each other? Here's the challenge that I put before you. Please. Let us emerge from this conference with some honest statements. They don't have to be shared about how we define our community. And I'm not talking about friends. What are the biggest concerns in our communities? What can we do to help on a concrete level? Dramaturgs can be not just the center of the theatrical universe, but instead agents of empathy and compassion and honesty in a world that wants it, needs it, yearns for it. Maybe it's not about a play. Maybe it's about just breathing the same air. Just for a minute. Thank you. Thank you to all of our keynote speakers. quickly. Remember to put questions in the Tiffany bag for the ECD panel in the morning, which will be hosted by Coriana Moffitt and Laurel Green in the faculty room. Everybody is welcome. They'll explain the rules of the game. We will be back here and start at 9.45 a.m. Have fun tonight. <laughs>